Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Cass? I'm doing good. We're joined by a special guest for the second time, Mike Burgersberg. How are you? I am doing quite well, guys. How are you? Hanging in there. Um, there's a lot going on today. Um, we did an update yesterday about the Alameda situation. Um, we mentioned you specifically, Mike, and how you had, at the very beginning of this, made the proclamation that FTX was insolvent. Um, and you were clearly correct about that. What we have discovered is that there is an $8 billion hole in their accounting. And we don't know how that happened. Um, or maybe we do. Let's talk about it. Uh, guys, whoever wants to get us started, please. <laughs> well, let's just go over some of the basics that have happened since yesterday. Binance has walked away from the deal. We found out there's, according to the Wall Street Journal, an $8 billion hole in the books. We've seen continued selling from Alameda. The Alameda website is deleted. The FTX Ventures website is deleted. FTX is non-functional. And the entire, oh, and we found out they've been under investigation by the SEC for like months now, which was a thing we kind of reported at Protos a couple weeks ago, if you were paying attention. But uh, yeah, and so um, things have the shit, the proverbial shit hit the proverbial fan. It's incredible, That's right. isn't it? That's right. And I want to, I think the next topic we should talk about, though, is that yesterday there was hope. The hope was that the savior, CZ from Binance, would come in, swoop in like the angel he is, and rescue FTX. Save all these, these retail customers who don't deserve this, right? And uh, lo and behold, that is not what has happened. Mike, can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, well, um, I've been constantly tweeting out every time someone said there was a deal non-binding because in the tweets and the various descriptions of this deal, it was a, like basically a pre-offer that had no legal, like he, he could walk away at any time. And, and the fact that the news people all reported it as being this like done deal, it's like, Oh, they're going to absorb them for sure. It's like, no, no, come on. Like, I'll come admit, on. I'll admit that yesterday I thought it was, relatively likely that Binance would end up acquiring FTX. I thought when they said liquidity crunch, there was a hole in the books, but like based on some of the things I had already identified on chain and stuff, I was thinking in the realm of like half a billion to 1.5 billion. I wasn't expecting 8 billion. I'm like, Binance might close a billion dollar hole to get FTX's customers. No one's closing an $8 billion hole for any reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the way that the way that they played that Binance played this from the beginning. I assume they were just out to cut their throat, and um, that's what they did. So, yeah, yeah, this was a very public, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, the idea that CZ was um, I, like the idea that you would ever suggest that you're gonna sell all this illiquid to token and try to do it without affecting the market. Well, you just screwed that up by announcing it, so that clearly. Right. He's not dumb enough to do that. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. But uh, we also have a supposed leak of their, of their, of Alameda, Alameda Research's uh, portfolio. Um, Which, and so, so just to be clear, that wasn't actually a leak of their portfolio. Someone went through and took some of their like known addresses and tried to like figure out what their exposure was and some of the things they've been doing. So that's not oh, actually like related yeah, to useless. their official balance sheets, but it is a useful peek into some of the things they're exposed to. Just wanted to I mean, maybe, that. yeah, maybe who knows? I mean, it, it matches as up. of what it's time missing... I, I haven't looked at it. Like yeah, what sure, time it, is it? It. Uh, yesterday, as of yesterday. Oh, okay, I'll take a look um, at that then. I wasn't sure. I thought it was just bullshit. It, it's missing their Solana stuff and some of the stuff like that, but it does have a bunch of their Ethereum things, and it's a lot of the stuff we knew they were exposed to, like $80 million in Abracadabra, Danny's little uh, protocol that Sifu helped him with for a while. Mm -hmm. What are we... I, I, there's so much. There's so much to kind of try to pick apart here. But what we do know, like, regardless, is that Binance walked away from this deal. This deal is not happening. Um, FTX has looked for anyone else 
to please God, please purchase them, and it hasn't happened. Um, and so what what we can suspect is that FTX is going to go into some sort of bankruptcy or something like they're insolvent. This is not good. This is the end of them. Um, now, Cass, but what do we think? Know, wait, Cass, did you know Pepsi went into bankruptcy? <laughs> right. drink Pepsi? It's the same thing. It's the same exact thing. Um, but but I think we haven't really understood what this means, because this means this means the other the only hope that there was to save this platform at large is dead. What do we think the ramifications for that are going to be now? Well, uh, we saw what happened when an obvious Ponzi scam called Terra blew up and everybody knew it was a scam. Uh, and FTX in comparison, I mean, I know that was like $15 billion or whatever it was worth technically, but like there wasn't the same kind of um, interdependencies that are involved with the FTX Alameda thing. I mean, they were involved with everybody. Um, or 3AC, I mean, that was what, a couple billion dollars? I, I was trying to look up how much it was actually that was lost. I'm not sure. Celsius, as far mm -hmm. as I can calculate, the whole is about $2.4 billion. So like Alameda FTX, if it's $8 billion dollars, is like two to three times the size of, of 3AC and Celsius put together. Uh, and both and both those companies were not nearly as central to the entire function of this, if you want to call it ecosystem or whatever. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see who goes down. But people are going to go down. There's no question. Yeah, so there's been, let's actually get, I want to, we might as well get into the weeds here because there's been a lot of questions about people that we previously discussed on this podcast and, and entities that we previously discussed on this podcast. So um, there was a lending episode that we did a long time ago where we specifically mentioned BlockFi, we mentioned Nexo, and we mentioned Celsius. So far, Celsius is gone. BlockFi got bought out by FTX, so we have no idea what that means. Um, and then lastly, we have Nexo when it comes to those three, which we can talk about. I, we should probably talk a little bit about that. And then mm -hmm. also the other one I wanted to mention was that we did one on market makers and uh, these larger entities like Cumberland Global and Genesis Trading. Um, Genesis Trading, apparently, you know, people are talking about it. Seems like they're in some big trouble. So I think maybe million we can dollars in credit losses, Cass. How That's dare it. you accuse them of having trouble in their multi-billion dollar book with seven million in losses. And and oh, and jump trading and jump trading is another one who I don't know if we mentioned them, but we have mentioned them in the tether papers, which, by the way, again, everybody, I, I you should reexamine the, the tether papers. There's a lot of great info in there. Um, but a lot of the entities that are mentioned in the tether papers are either no more or um, are in deep, deep doo doo right now. But let's let's talk about some of these counterparties and and what to expect in the following days, weeks, months. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Genesis and I was being somewhat glib, right? And it was like seven million dollars in credit losses because that's what they announced on their Twitter today. Um, but you're right. There have been a couple of persistent rumors that that is less than the full truth. And um, I think it's quite plausible that they have much more substantial losses than that. I mentioned on my Twitter that at one point they had over 3 million FTX token uh, towards like the beginning of June. And by like the end of June, they had like 300,000 FTT token and they finally dumped the last of it yesterday. Um, yeah, yesterday. Sorry, the days are blurring together. And so I would be surprised if we've seen the end of their total exposure to this yeah i mean all i can say i haven't looked carefully into this but there is a massive amount of interaction between known alameda wallets and genesis on chain so i mean your guess is as good as mine but it's like if alameda was this giant i mean here's the thing i mean the problem is that we're still operating on the assumption that alameda was even doing what they said they were doing how do we know? I mean, if they, if they vaporize $8 billion, we have no clue what they were doing. Let's be well, real here. I, I think that's actually kind of a good point that we should pause on for a moment here in that this is fucking weird. <laughs> like Alameda was at least sometimes a market maker. And most of that should be delta neutral. They should be making the spread and they should be comfortably making money, which some other market makers seem to have been doing. 
Cumberland Global, for example, has... I haven't heard any rumors of any distress over there, and they seem to be continuing to just make money by providing liquidity like a market maker is supposed to. Um, now, the other tricky kind of parts around that is that, like, Alameda clearly wasn't just doing that. They were venture capital investing. They had a bunch of equity in projects. They were buying random shit coins. Like, their exposure to these to the dumbest tokens ever you can find in their wallet. Like, Shiba Inu is an incredibly stupid token, and they would find, like, Shiba Floki whatever <coughs> dot 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 random token and would have, like, a weird amount of it that constitutes, like, a strange portion of the total market cap. And, and sorry, just to get back to the point, they were regularly taking advantage of some of the, like, highest paying yield firms ftx had supposedly a good amount of volume when they should have been making a decent amount of fees on it and based on their ftx token burns we've got some idea of what their revenue was and so like these should have been reasonably profitable entities that should have had money but like there's eight billion dollars that are just gone that we know of so far i could see that number going up isn't it? I it, mean, it, obviously, it, it, if, as a crypto sorry, market falls, the number will sorry, go down. I think, but... I think, I think it will go up because I think that's the whole in FTX's book, and I think Alameda is also separately from FTX, also insolvent and unable to pay their debts. Oh, absolutely. And so I think, in addition to the eight billion dollars at FTX, there's more hundreds of millions or billions over at Alameda, and so the total thing here is just like several times larger than Celsius, than BlockFi, than Voyager, even meaning. At, it's at least as large as 3AC and in this case brought an exchange with it which was providing all this liquidity and all this stuff across the marketplace and it's just it's incredible yeah 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 i mean i don't know huh i mean it's a lot of liquidity that's suddenly evaporating um which gets to the other company that i just mentioned which is nexo these lenders seem to hmm. rely on liquidity i think they need they need people trading these assets they need people coming onto their platforms they need to be constantly onboarding new people i wonder what this sounds like it doesn't let's not get into that but anyway so uh, they constantly just, need new customers to pay out their old customers but anyway go on let's it, talk about this one you had you had mentioned this and this is another one of the details in uh the reporting over at protos i think has gone underappreciated is that like during the period when the rest of the withdrawals were getting shut off the erc20 tokens the tron tokens the solana tokens all of that ethereum withdrawals stayed open and during like the last 36 hours that those withdrawals ran nexo was one of the largest withdrawers from was sorry a lar a massive portion of the withdrawals from ftx ended up going to nexo at the time worth like 113 million dollars and this is either like nexo's prop desk pulling assets off of ftx this could be alameda posting assets for a loan they got from nexo or this could be uh individuals pulling assets off of FTX and deciding that Nexo is going to be a better custodian. But it was a massive amount of outflows, like right before it was fully cut off. Yeah. And they're claiming now that they have no exposure as far as I know. Yeah. Or, or de minimis exposure or something like that. Um, and so I am curious about the nature of those transactions in the hours before withdrawals were shut off. And I think that it's important for us to mention, like, as you mentioned in your coverage before, Mike, that like Kentucky, when they were looking into Nexo, noted that ignoring the value of Nexo token on the balance sheet, Nexo has also been insolvent. And like the value of Nexo on the balance sheet, like the value of sell on the Celsius balance sheet or the value of FTX token on Alameda or FTX's balance sheet is a mirage. It's a it's a thing that continues to exist for as long as people continue to believe it exists, printed out of thin air and dependent on this collective belief in it. Well, I, I think I think Mike also made a really good point before in just talking about the eight billion that we know of so far, because here's the reality, right? We've heard about this eight billion dollar hole um, that didn't even come from Sam himself. But what we do know is that Sam said everything is fine. FTX is fine. We do know that he pretended he was going to be involved in the Twitter purchase by Elon Musk. We know that he's done a bunch of stuff in the past month, two months that would there. Clearly, he was a con man. 
I mean, it, very, very clearly, he was a con man. He was leveraging this sense of, well, everyone trusts him. He's a rich guy. Why would you ever question what he says to you? And the reality is, I think a lot of people need to be asking this about a lot of companies in the cryptocurrency industry, period, right? Whether we're talking about Nexo or Genesis or Jump or whoever, like them telling you their assets are fine is really in, especially in this industry is proof of absolutely nothing yeah and i mean i think sam probably you know whatever else he won't get the award for the biggest ponzi scheme in history he probably could get the award for the least charismatic ponzi scammer in history like the guy's a goofball the fact that anybody thought this guy was a genius blows my mind like you could when he went in public and talked about what he was doing he was like yeah it's a ponzi but it's a good ponzi you know like come on man and all these all these big investors fell for it. I mean, it's just like <sighs> this. This was one of the things I struggled with in a newsletter I wrote for Protos a couple weeks ago. Go called uh, "What Does Sam Bankman Fried Believe?" Because like he convinced so many people that he was this positive person for the space, but the entire time he was doing like the most extractive things and like the most exploitive things and like he ended up getting blown up in the same way that he has blown up protocols and traders and other people like that in the exact same way. And like, yeah, he was this just mercenary trader and mercenary investor who got the same thing to happen to him and ended up blown out. And in like that, and just, this is a bit of a diversion, but in that same vein of like what Sam Bankman Fried believes he claimed that like the reason he needed all this money and to earn all this and to do all of this was because it was going to be for the good of the world, that this was the best use of his time because earning this money would allow him to do a greater amount of good for the world. And he would use that to justify all of the things he did in terms of trying to earn that money. And in the same breath would often end up citing kind of the utilitarian ideas of Jeremy Bantham. And so for those who are unfamiliar, and he would actually describe himself as a Banthamite. Jeremy Bantham was the creator of the idea of a panopticon and like thought that the best way for us to determine like what's morally good and morally bad is to track every single thing that every single person does and measure every single actions, either good impact or bad impact and use that to determine which people are good and which people are bad and even created like designs architectural plans for prisons where the entire concept was that you believed you were under constant surveillance by like people who were watching every single action you took for every single second of the day to try to force you to have good behavior and this is like the person that sam claimed was like his philosophical inspiration and like meanwhile sam is like pushing for blockchains where all of your transactions are happening on a public ledger where every single person can see every single thing you do and then pushing for this legislation so that all the people who use this thing end up having to go through these KYC places that he controls and you have all of this information potentially at your hands of every single thing that all these people are buying and every single thing that they're doing and that was like what Sam wanted he wanted to extract your wealth and to know exactly what you were doing with all of your money and that's what he tried to like create and that was the best possible case for his legacy and now what's actually happened is he ended up stealing billions of dollars from retail investors well maybe it's a good thing he blew himself up then you know like maybe the alternative would have been much worse <laughs> but yeah um i yeah yeah uh oh uh i sorry and i don't know i don't know what to say about that either other than to suggest that he, I think everybody's under the running under the assumption now that customer funds were stolen and traded with. And uh, last I heard, he is not in communication with the FTX staff any longer. And as far as I know, he hasn't tweeted in over 24 hours. Well, I hope um, that he's still in one piece. I'm sure he's fine. I'm not suggesting he's not fine. I think he's well, fine. I, mean, I think the question is where where is he and what's going on? Wasn't he still giving statements to the Wall Street Journal as of a couple hours well, ago when he's like doing he? emergency funding and stuff like that? Yeah. So I think he's fine. I don't think there was some fake tweets from fake accounts that were trying to convince people he was on the run or stuff like that. But Frank, I think Frank, a... Shaparo, Frank Shaparo specifically said that while the tweets were fake about him being on the run, tweets the, the reality is that he has not been in contact with employees. 
that he has not been in contact with these people, that he is not in, in discussing things with them in Slack, and that he's not getting into the weeds of what's happening any longer. I, I think this is actually a, a good entry point to talk about what I thought was one of the weird things that was going on with it, which is that Sam didn't communicate with FTX employees or FTX investors about the letter of intent that was signed by CZ to purchase FTX. And then when Sam finally did send a letter out to people, it was um, lacking in substance and was kind of like, you know, things happen, this is bad, but maybe it'll be good when things get better and this all happens. And um, yeah, that's been weird. We're like that, that Sam apparently didn't Sam and Alameda, according to some of the reporting, hadn't talked to CZ or reached out to him except in tweet form by Carolyn until like the price of FTX was crashing and like Carolyn may or may not have been escorted out of the building and like there's been a bunch a of lot weird of stuff there's going a lot on. Of rumors. But there's like a lot the of rumors. report so far from like the Wall Street Journal and stuff is that at some point Sam calls CZ and goes, I've got a five to $10 billion hole in my books. Do you want to help her? And then that's when they get the like letter of intent signed without talking to FTX employees, FTX shareholders or anyone else. And then the deal ends up blown up when CZ actually gets a look at the books and goes, oh, that's that hole's very real and not going to be filled. So I guess my question then is like, I wonder how much Binance knew before they did this. Like, I wonder if they knew things were as bad as they were. I mean, they, like, I feel like, given, I, I knew I knew very little, but, like, I'm one guy with Etherscan. Like, I don't know that much. I'm just screwing around with this stuff. These guys have a whole team of people probably monitoring this shit constantly. Like, they should have had some idea of how bad it would be if they took out FTX. And, so and, I still don't totally understand the motive. And I think I said that, I think I might have said this before we ended up going live when we were chatting, is that I think they thought the hole was smaller than it was. It's very possible, yeah. I think so, they thought there was a hole they'd be able to drive FTX into an uncomfortable position and buy it for cheap, and then they saw the hole. But I, I was I was talking to you and some other people, Bennett, earlier, and the, I think motive is the right question here. Because, look, I understand driving a competitor out of business if you think you can afford to deal with it. But I also suspect that CZ is smart enough to be like, maybe this is worse than I can even perceive on chain right now. Like, I, I'm sure he was looking at the chain and going, oh, they don't have enough Ethereum and stuff to cover their assets. Like, I, I am, I, you know, not, I'm as close to 100% sure as I can be without him. I know he said he definitely didn't do anything. I get it. I hear, I hear it. He's, I, I whatever. But anyway, I think <clears throat> you still would need a really good reason because he's smart enough to suspect maybe it's worse than I can perceive. And you still have to have a good reason to do this because if it's really bad and you think it could actually screw with your business, then it's a bad move. It's a really bad move to try to knock this competitor out of business because he's now painted, he's painted a, a big crosshair on his back. Huge. He's the only, this is the only real liquid exchange pretty much in the world and he's painted a huge crosshair on his back to regulators to anybody like some someone will i'm sure somebody's going to try to nail binance to the cross I, i'm 100 yeah. percent sure so yeah. why do this if you know that that's how that's going to end right what is the motive here and i'm so, and i am genuinely cur curious I, I think there is one other thing that we're not considering which is that maybe CZ didn't have a master plan. And maybe he took FTT token because it thought it gave him a lot of the upside of equity without some of the downside when he ended up leaving his FTX equity position. And then what if he noticed that since June there have been these weird withdrawals from what might have been the FTX cold wallet through the FTX hot wallet into the Alameda Research Binance deposit address. And then you see the balance sheet and you go, oh, things are worse than I thought. And you have this, it was what, one it, it was what five hundred sixty million and two that billion dollar position in FTX token that no, he had. Was it and that he much? Said, yeah, he said we're gonna sell this over the next several months. He might have just legitimately wanted to devis that position because he realized FTX was not as straightforward as they had been. And then as soon as they started trying to de-risk, they realized how bad it was, and the rest was just responding to that. 
It's possible. I mean, who knows? Like, it could have really just been that fragile. Like, Alameda was really counting on having no real meaningful cell pressure because they controlled so much and they didn't think CZ would just suddenly go and dump it. And then Well, and the did. thing was, so the thing was that maybe, you know, if they had faced, if it had just been one or the other, right? Like, if it had just been cell pressure or if it had just been withdrawals, maybe they would have been able to somehow pull it off at least long enough that people would have stopped withdrawing and the run would have been over. But when you have a combination of your token that you're levered on is getting crushed and you got people with around billions of dollars, then you're done. I mean, that was one, two punch, you know? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we'll ever know, you know? I mean, it makes for a good story though. No one could have written this. It, it sure does feel like, um, like cryptocurrency Armageddon. I mean, this is, uh, Bennett and I have been following this for solidly since at least 2018. And uh, this is the eeriest feeling ever. I like, I, I it truly feels like a, apocalyptic. Like everybody, I, I'm seeing traders just, it's total capitulation. Um, this, and yeah. this is this is worse than Celsius. This is worse oh yeah, than Celsius is nothing compared to this. Yeah, this is worse yeah. than Voyager. This is. I, I would argue at this point, like looking at the reaction so far, worse than the Bitfinex hack in 2016, which was an industry shaking event at the time. And we keep hinting at it like there's more ramifications to be felt here. We don't know exactly who all the counterparties are, but we know Alameda had these loans out. We know FTX has this hole and there are other people exposed. There's funds that are going to get blown up and there might even be protocols and stuff that kept most or all of their treasury with FTX who are going to find that inaccessible. Like the overall consequences of this have not been fully felt yet and I need everyone to hear that. Like this is going to continue to have ramifications for weeks, months, and probably years. Get yeah. out. Okay. If you have your money, if, if you, number one, okay, you want to believe in crypto, that's your business. Fine. If you have it on any, any platform, any platform that you do not control, okay, you don't know where the money is, withdraw that shit now because it's going to be gone. Uh, period. I mean, th here's the thing, like, number one, yeah, we have to think about who's directly exposed and then who's exposed to the people who are exposed, et cetera, et cetera. But then we also have to think about the psychological effect of this, right? I mean, again, we go back to the Terra thing. That was an obvious, stupid Ponzi that blew up. And that, that shook people's confidence tremendously. Celsius was a, a decent-sized Ponzi scam that had some ramifications in a few hundred thousand customers. That shook sentiment quite a bit. 3AC shook sentiment quite a bit. But this isn't, I mean, FTX was like, they probably were the biggest spender in terms of advertising, I think. I mean, they, they were, like, nationally known. In, in terms of the U.S., like, if you're somebody who doesn't know anything about crypto, you probably would recognize FTX because, I mean, they had goddamn Tom Brady fronting for them, you know? I mean, they like, own, they They own the naming rights. They yeah, own the naming stadium. rights. They have, to, their name, to... they have their name on the damned umpire uniforms. I mean, holy shit. I, like, every time I saw that, I would just, like, laugh. By the way, I would that just deal... laugh every time. By the way, that deal has never been disclosed, so we have no idea what FTX paid paid to have the the umpire uniforms plastered with their logo. I hope that Sam. I yeah. hope that Sam. I hope that was a joke. I hope that I hope that he he was laughing when he did that because like that's a great joke. I mean, you can't get only much better than that. Only baseball fan. Yeah, only baseball fans will understand this. But yeah, it 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 is pretty damn silly to have FTX plastered on the the rules rules yeah. and regulations of baseball basically he, um, he tried to plaster himself on the rules and regulations of cryptocurrency he yeah. tried to buy off half of DC That's, like yeah. and yet he was well there, there's 50 million dollars there's 50 million dollars of customer money right there went to our lovely politicians so this yeah, is, we know where 50 so, million went and this is this is interesting I, I saw someone say this more or less where it's like oh so okay effective Effective altruism is when you take your customer's money and donate it to whatever you feel like donating it to. And it's like, yep, I, that pretty much describes what they think is effective altruism. It's, it's and, and like, yeah, yes, yes. Because like Sam Bankman free got so much coverage for, for being an effective altruist and this long termist and all these other words. Um, and like at the end of the day, what he actually donated to was a few politicians who might move the needle a little on pandemic prevention, maybe. 
And like, that's it. He didn't buy a whole bunch of malaria nets, didn't do like any of the other things that yeah. would have large immediate impacts. He maybe had a small diffuse future impact. And that's the philanthropist. That's the altruist. That's the next Andrew Carnegie who is being crowned thanks to brilliant work by whoever his PR team was. Like props to them. They have excelled over the last two years. The thing I don't get is like, Imagine how much I think the Heat Stadium was like fifty million or something. I don't remember exactly how 100, much the name 130, was. 135. Jesus. Okay. Well, I mean, imagine if instead of putting one hundred thirty-five million into a stadium, he'd been like FTX. We're giving one hundred thirty-five million dollars to malaria prevention in Africa. Wouldn't that be a better marketing strategy? I mean, like, I no. mean, that's what I mean. It's like you. Could, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. I you wish, could, I like wish, you could spin I wish it I could that say way. Yes. I wish I, I don't could know. say yes, but definitely I don't know. Not. I mean, how many people do you think really how many think how many people think actually ended up using FTX because they put their name on a stadium? I, I really don't, don't know. I don't know. No, see I think after the initial ho- ho- hoopla of it, probably not many. But the, right. when you first do it, when you first do it, not only not only is it a good thing in terms of oh, there's a bunch of eyeballs and a bunch of media reporting on it. Also, it establishes that you are legitimate. A, you're a respectable business. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. That's what I guess. I, like that. That's the main, that's the main corporate goal because what it does is it puts you in the same league, uh, without right. Uh, as, as, uh, as I don't know, let's say minute made, um, or who, Enron. Or, which is, Co- which is Coca-Cola for us. We think Enron for us. We think about yeah. Wachovia for us. We think about all of these, these deals gone bad as I pointed or as, hmm, as was pointed out in an article by Protos, the, there's 75 professional stadiums in America. Like the curse is not real. Like there, the, yeah, of the, course. There's yeah. naming rights exist for a reason. We understand that, right? But like, yeah, this is not good. That 135 million could have been spent elsewhere. Also, and, this brings up a, another good one, which is we're talking about we're talking about contagion right now. Crypto.com spent 700 plus million dollars. On the naming rights for the let's just call it the Staples Center because that's what it is um, for the quote Crypto.com Arena, and they, they also seven hundred million dollars for that for it, two listen, decades. It's it's all about getting your name in front of sports betters, so that I guess when that's they true. decide yeah, they want to yeah. start speculating on cryptocurrency on crypto. and they're deciding between which one they want to like that's right pick. Between Did you see that Dave Portnoy between tweet? Between Gemini, between FTX, you pick the one whose name is on the team you bet on the most. Did you guys yeah, see what this? Portnoy, uh, the, what's Portnoy complaining about now? I'm going to read it. Uh, I have a dumb question. If I bought Bitcoins through FTX and FTX goes belly up, where do they go? Like, Bitcoins yeah. are finite, right? Does well, anybody have access to them no. or are they just the lost Bitcoin, in the, the ether are fine. or something forever? Well, I mean, the Bitcoins the bi- still exist. I know, but it's just like the fact that this guy's. I mean, I don't know if he's joking. I'm assuming he's not joking. No, he is being very serious. He's a very stupid sexual predator. Like, holy shit. <laughs> but, like, he's a great example of an idiot sports better who gets sucked in. So, I mean, you know, good point. Like, holy shit. I, he's been talking about crypto for a while. He absolutely bought this stuff. You know, now that I think about it, probably Tom Brady or somebody reached out to him and said, FTX is the way to go. If you're going to buy, you should buy there. Maybe it was even, maybe it was even Sam. Um, and, yes, you remember and, when uh, he was doing like pump and dumps on his like daily live stream, right? Like he's a, he's a piece of shit. Does he not, he him. doesn't do that anymore? I, I mean, I try to avoid Portnoy bubbling up into my view as much as I can in life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, I, I think a lot of these uh, a lot of these athletes probably had uh, funds on FTX. Now that I think about it, um, which is well, I mean, it looks like Dave, like looks like Tom Brady actually got suckered into buying equity. I thought he they thought they gave him equity as part of his deal. And Giselle, and yeah. Giselle. My guess is the way the deal was structured is they got in at a lower price than the like oh, most what a good deal. Round of equity what a good deal. How nice of Sam to do that for them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, by so the well, way, that's good. Tom Brady is an adult male in control of at least some of his faculties, and he's allowed to make whatever investment decisions he so chooses. It's probably all the head injuries, man. I mean, let's be <laughs> real. Listen, as a former offensive lineman who spent 10 years playing football, I'm just going to say that 
and he lost the thought. Probably, probably <laughs> shouldn't control their own money. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say on that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I think I, we've we've clearly expressed that there's uh, it's a shit show. I like I don't know how else to express this right now. We've and the price action is only down. Um, we are. I don't know. What, oh, it was back up above Bitcoin, sixteen thousand. It was a second ago, so it's okay. Everything's fine, guys. Don't worry about it. Uh, yes, Bitcoin, we're back Bitcoin, to levels. We're back to 2017. Not, this is fantastic for Bitcoin. That was only fine. half a decade ago. It's we're early. It truly got we got years. It, I believe what when was the last time we saw levels this low? Was it 2018, 2019? I guess I, I'm not I'm not sure, but it's been a few years, hasn't it? Um, and yeah, that that's just Bitcoin. But that also again last I think the last point I want to bring up because we're talking contagion here. The last point I want to bring up is that. This is now affecting actual real life markets, not just cryptocurrency. MicroStrategy, Coinbase, GBTC, um, uh, Silvergate. Silvergate. <laughs> um, Signature a Bank lot of too. Don't Signature, Signature Bank as well. And as disclosure, mm -hmm. I am short both Coinbase and Signature Bank. So whatever I say is Thank colored you. by that. Appreciate but, that. Yeah. Yeah. Good to good to point out. But but we've previously had like uh, Jim Chanos on. He was short uh, Coinbase, and I think that it was trading for, I believe it was trading for around seventy dollars at that time. Mm -hmm. um, Cass, can I interject for a moment? Please. This is one of the things that's been inexplicable to me about the cryptocurrency exchanges recently, which is that where is the money going? They're supposed to be like printing money in terms of fees and especially like during bull markets from retail traders they give discounts to a lot of the market makers and many of the market makers end up trading for close to free so you can't like do a direct like volume times fee equals revenue calculation but if you look at like their burns of many of these exchange tokens they supposedly have pretty healthy revenues but like coinbase is burning 500 million dollars per quarter still ftx has an eight billion dollar hole where is the money going Is it? Are, 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 are I mean, it costs a lot to run these businesses. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it costs a lot to run these businesses. I mean, there's no. How question, much does it like, cost? Because none of them hire I mean, very many employees. They don't hire very many. Well, I think employees. Coinbase probably has a lot of. I mean, how much it costs Coinbase to develop their NFT platform? It costs them like five hundred million dollars to make a stupid platform. Overstaffed. <laughs> yeah, but like <laughs> FTX is not. That's not the excuse. I mean, Celsius had nine hundred employees to run a Ponzi. So like, it takes you know, it takes a lot of effort to run money around in the circle. Uh, I don't know. Somebody's somebody. I mean, somebody has to have the money, right? I I don't know. Of course, that's how Ponzi's work. I mean, every the, every time somebody withdraws, it's their money plus the returns. And if the returns the, were never there to begin with, that takes a lot out. This is the beauty, though, of equity and and particularly cryptocurrency equity, right? Is that how much ever went in. How much money yeah. ever went it's, in, and we it's don't all illiquid. It's marked yeah. to model. It's we marked don't know. Cat. It's, exactly. As it's transparent like, as the as the I cryptocurrency mean, world is. It's like let's assume. Yes, sorry. Well, ahead, I mean, man. we can assume that. Let's assume that like Tether is sort of back. Let's assume it's like eighty percent. Let's assume that. Let's assume USDC and BUSD are legitimate, which I think is reasonable. So that's what like reasonably legitimate. There's over that's a hundred and some billion dollars. <laughs> that's like well over a hundred billion dollars. There's a lot of money in sure. here. Sure, sure. But like, yeah, sure. I don't know, man. I don't know. And then I you still have, haven't figured you, out. You do, like, you you do you do have Michael Saylor? Uh, yeah. I legitimately buying Bitcoin. You have yeah. Naib Bukele legitimately buying Bitcoin. You have real money definitely coming into the the eco ecosystem, right? Definitely, yeah. no doubt about it. But we don't know how much because it turns out that behind the scenes. When you start getting into the three ACs, the Celsiuses, and the FTXs of, of the industry, suddenly most of the deals that they're doing are in a liquid shit coins that never had very much money behind them. And we don't know the answer to that, do we? I... Well, and my guess, I mean, ultimately the whole will be in dollars. So like with, with Celsius, there are a number of different assets that they're short. They're short Bitcoin, they're short Ethereum, they're short basically everything except their stupid token that they had. Uh, but if you look at like where their hole was when they shut down withdrawals, it was all dollars. That was what got sucked out of the system. It wasn't Ether or Bitcoin. It was dollars. So the question is, where the hell did they send all the actual money to? Um, and I haven't figured that out yet. 
and so and then Alameda is going to be a much more complex beast because that's you know it's much larger and much more in integrated into everything. I have no idea where the hell all this money went. No clue. I I've spent twelve hours over the last two days and another six hours at least last week going over like on chain transactions trying to track all the money, and I am nowhere in the ballpark of an eight billion dollar hole like i can find some transactions that look funky some that make me go this looks like it might be them misappropriating funds but like i said i'm in the range of like half a billion to maybe one and a half billion eight billion is just such an incomprehensible number like even as i mentioned before like compared to the other things we've seen recently it's just it's stunning and from the guy who went in front of congress and talked about how like the most important thing is to protect customer deposits and who was like saying all these things in front of lawmakers and stuff it's just so brazen and so massive and like i i think it's important for us to kind of bring together here some of the details like and what the motivation was here which is and we talked about this way back in our contagion episode 3ac failing was unexpected and a lot of people who had lent money, including people you might not generally think of as lenders, ended up way overexposed on it. Because of that, Alameda and FTX Ventures started stepping in and offering bailouts. And what we've now learned is that those bailouts were financed by basically customer deposits of FTX, whether directly or indirectly, we can argue about later. But like fundamentally, that money was coming from FTX customers in an attempt to try to slow down the overall contagion, to try to contain it. And I think in Sam's mind, hold out until the next bull market when these valuations would be super inflated again, and he could start trying to correct the massive hole he knew he left. And then because CZ started to recognize there was some kind of problem and started to de-risk, it started a bank run which shouldn't have been possible, and that collapsed the entire edifice. Yeah, this reminds me, I was talking to uh, or tweeting with Mark Dow uh, earlier today, and I said something along the lines of, the reason that this is going on at all is because there was too much leverage and no due, due diligence. And he said something, I'm not going to be quoting him word for word here, but he said something along the lines of, when, when you obliterate credit, when you only care about greed and competition. So like you obliterate your, any, any real checks and balances for credit, for giving out money, for loans, for let over leveraging, you obliterate that when all you're doing is trying to get the number to go up. And I think that that is the reality of this situation. It really just boils down to that. Like, I don't know what happened with Alameda. I don't know how, I don't even under, I honestly, I cannot comprehend stealing someone's money that they gave to me, using it to trade against them, which again, who knows, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this isn't how it worked, but this is what it sounds like to everyone. I, I take, I take Bennett's money. I trade against him and then I somehow lose his money and I can't give it back to him. I don't even understand. I can't comprehend it. It's hard to comprehend how that money vanishes like that. Like I I'm stealing, I'm stealing from, from customers to pay random strangers or other exchanges. Like I, it's, it's, it is truly mind boggling what clearly the, the discrepancies and probably fraud that was going on with the the man in front of Congress. Uh, the ramifications for that, I think, is an important point. Just because, uh, like, we're talking about the ramifications financially right now. We're talking about financial contagion. We're talking about all the all the stuff that people care about. People care about price, price action. That's that's all these people care about. But honestly, the, the part of this that I still can't believe is that the guy's name is Bankman Fried. <laughs> I mean, like. <laughs> You can't even, you can't write this. I mean, like, it's insane. Like, the guy, I mean, just. But he did, he was the, he, him and Brian Armstrong are the only two faces right now that are standing up more or less in front of, and Coin Center. But besides these, besides these yeah. three people, entities, there's very few people going in front of Congress and advocating for the cryptocurrency industry. And guess what? Turns out he was a giant scammer. I, I, yeah. And now I'm sure Biden, it was just that's him, another thing. Right. Yeah, it's only it's only SPF. I I don't know that that point's been fully appreciated by everyone in cryptocurrency at the point you're making, Cass, which is that there's been 
There's been a effort by many people in crypto to try to affect cryptocurrency regulation, but Sam really has been spearheading a ton of it recently. And him being outed as an $8 billion hole, what, there was a total of 11 point something invest, invested in Madoff? Like, we're talking Madoff level fraud here. Like, you just gave every regulatory agency, every lawmaker, and every single person who might have an agenda, like a reason to decide that now crypto is the enemy. And this is at a time when the US Treasury Department has already shown they'll sanction a smart contract and anyone who interacts with that smart contract. Like, I don't know that anyone's fully appreciated what's what like the symbol of the good guy failing is going to have in DC. I mean, all these politicians are going to have to cover all the ones who took money from him and took pictures with him, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to go the exact opposite way and be as absolutely, you know, balls to the wall, you're done, we're going to fry you, it's game over. I mean, that. I don't know if people comprehend, and you're right. That's what I mean about this having the psychological effect alone of this is going to be... It's, it's not even, you can't even, uh, you can't even like... Project almost insurmountable almost insurmountable not so, in, not necessarily insurmountable but like, insurmountable what, what you mentioned there mike is something Cass and i were talking about earlier which is like that even biden may be motivated to like make an example of sam because sam was his second largest donor and when you're running against like a party and probably a candidate yeah. whose entire platform is corruption and you need to try to pitch yourself as like anti-corruption and anti that kind of capture it might yeah. be valuable to you politically to make an example of your second largest donor and so sam invested millions of dollars in the hopes of a get out of jail free card and it might be a go to jail card yeah <laughs> because remember Arthur Hayes, what ended up negotiating for like suspended release and all from like home arrest and stuff. And so like, and I don't think that's going to be true for Sam. My gut feeling right now is Sam is in deep trouble. I want to clarify. I like, we might not like the way that BitMEX was run. We might not like the way that Arthur Hayes dealt with his business. Plenty of illegal things going on in red flags. Um, but he didn't steal the he... customer's money, did he? No, he directly. traded not against. As as we know. He not traded as as we against know. customers, but he didn't. He didn't really traded... take the money out and and no. put it somewhere else. No, no, exactly. There's and a difference be between those point. two things. There's a very big. That difference was going to be my point. He traded against yeah. customers. He didn't steal their money and then trade against them. And look, I, and I, then I, I know the bar. The bar exactly. The bar is low, uh, but like Arthur yeah. Hayes never did that, and and like that he doesn't. I, the fact that he's not in prison makes sense to me on on some level the fact that i think he, sbf he ended up cooperating the fact that i think sbf is at I, like i am it, it's the most sure i've felt about in a person who's running an exchange in cryptocurrency going to prison that the I, only like, way that I felt ever the only way sam gets out of this well he will almost certainly i mean come on i, I mean i'm not a lawyer i just do this for fun but like he's probably gonna do prison none time. of us are lawyers the only way the only way he gets out of this is if he can give up somebody who's bigger, and there's only a couple people who are bigger than Sam, so. And he just demonstrated he has no leverage against those people. He just well, demonstrated in a very public fashion that those people are people who have him by the balls, metaphorically. Exactly. They did. They, they physically can't come to D.C. as Sam will quickly point out, but metaphorically they have his balls. Well, you just can have to Sam, wonder, I mean, the relationship between Sam Tether and C Alameda. Can, I mean, can Sam go to D.C. now? Yeah, right. He might end up staying there for longer than planned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, no, um, I, I, I do want to kind of, I know we keep coming back to this, but, like, this has been incredibly strange for me to observe. Like, this has been a really weird series of events. And, like, at one point, I was looking for Alameda's Ethereum cold wallet, and I ended up saying nice things about Bitfinex because I could at least find their cold wallet. And it was, like, in the expected place and did the expected thing with their hot wallet and had roughly the expected amount of Ethereum I would think would be there. And that wasn't true for Alameda, or not for Alameda, for FTX. And I was having this moment where, like, 
this is this person who's been in front of the lawmakers, in front of Congress, in front of the regulators, and who's been trying to control so much of the industry is worse than like companies Anyone. who I thought were like paragons of bad behavior. <laughs> and that's been disorienting. Yeah, I found myself saying the nicest things about Tether that I've ever said probably in the past few days, which is just um, they exist. Troubling they for my troubling for my exist. sanity. Yeah, it's troubling for my sanity for sure. Um, but yeah, okay. So look, I think we've we've more or less covered. I think the overall. I don't know. There, no, we haven't. No, we no, haven't. There, there's, there's a lot more. There's a lot more to cover. I'm sure we could go on for ten or twenty hours. Um, continually updating everybody about all the craziness going on, but we're not going to do that. Well, I, 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 I wanted us more? to. Uh, sure. I do think that it's kind of uh, interesting that we found out today that basically the entire FTX legal and compliance team quit. And since we were talking about sports betters before, this is a good time to mention that Daniel Friedberg, the like, uh, was he the general counsel or the head of regulatory affairs? He was one of the top lawyers over at FTX, used to be over at Excapsa with Stuart Hogner and was like, and helped cover up like Ultimate Bet and, uh, oh, what was the other one? Huh. The other cheating poker site, Full Tilt. One Full of the tilt. other ones. He was involved in all of the same poker BS that Stuart Hogner was back in his days as a gaming lawyer. And so we've got those two buddies back again. And we've got the rest of the lawyers and compliance team just deciding that, you know what? It's not worth figuring out what went wrong here at FTX. I can find a better job. Can they? <sighs> I'd rather be unemployed, I think, is what, they're, is, what they're, is what they're deciding. Yeah. Um, Look, okay, so we've we've kind of run through the updates that have happened over the course of one single day. Um, but I know we were talking, all of us, about opening up some of this to some questions. If anybody had any, there might not be any questions. I guess I have no idea. I haven't checked. Um, and well, I think if not, great. Questions. We'll just, just walk away. But um, I did want to let uh, viewers and listeners uh, so, take uh, a... One question we got, Cass, was, do you think if Tether implodes, will it be bigger than this? And yes, if. if Everything it, will yeah, just I stop. Mean, Everything just stops at that point. <laughs> like, it, it just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it's I over. think I think that um, it's really, I think that's essentially what you're saying is an interesting way of putting it, because I think there's no way any of us can even fathom it right now. Like, the idea of that, that extra issue being on top of all of the ca cascading issues that are happening right now even me as someone who kind of has been like well i think it's gonna fail for a really long time is like god i hope it doesn't i hope it doesn't fail right now please don't Why? fail right now um because i think because a lot uh, of people would get hurt a lot yeah. of people are gonna get hurt regardless it dep I think that i so i do here's here's my argument and they're gonna this, fail this, they're gonna fail at some point this is what there's there's different kinds of failure though I think is is the reality um, and I think if you can look if he's if they've been if they've been buying a bunch of treasuries and there's essentially let's just in air quotes say fully backed right now um, oh, no, let's even say Mike's eighty percent because that's a lot better than it might have been at certain points in history and right like and we talked about last episode sometimes bankruptcy is the best option like there's ways to more gracefully fail yeah exactly well, i mean 80 percent backed would be better than ftx yeah i so we think yeah. all i'm saying is yeah, we're going to find I, out at some point we are going to find I, out we will and look i hope i hope there's no problems at tether i don't believe yeah. that there's no problems at tether because they've lied a lot so I have no reason to believe them the same way that like no one should just believe words out of somebody's mouth as is it's been expounded on repeatedly now, uh, especially with FTX, uh, 3AC, Do Kwan, Alex Mashinsky, the list goes on. So um, the idea that Paolo or friends will be like, everything is great over here. Shut up. That doesn't instill me with any sense of confidence. I'm not suggesting as much, but I do think that there's better and worse ways to fail and there's better and worse times to fail. And I really hope that Tether is one, not going to fail anytime soon. And two, uh, 
If they did, I hope it would be very, very gracefully. That's all I'm going to say. Things are very fragile right now. And yeah. I think there's... Alameda tried very hard to hide some of the fragility of the system by doing this bailout where they took these funds from FTX. And so additional failures at this point will further expose the fragility of the system and can cascade uncomfortably. Here's and, my thing, okay, guys? Is that, it, and I probably shouldn't say this because I know a lot of the people who like follow me now on Twitter are like big crypto people. At the end of the day, my opinion is that this is basically a tumor on the face of our economy. Okay. It needs to, it needs to be extirpated. So, so I talked to, I, I talked to somebody today about the idea that I like, I don't, I don't hate Bitcoin. I don't think Bitcoin, I can understand why there's criticisms about it. I can understand why there's people who want it sure. to die. Yeah, Fair I mean, enough. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, a, a fundamentally on its own, it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's a vehicle for ripping people off and it has been for a very long time. Sure, but knives are used for stabbing people, but they're also used for cutting meat. Like, I, it's just What not, do you use Bitcoin like the, for? What do you use Bitcoin for I, besides? I think it can be, I think it can actually, so I, I, this is, this, yeah, I do think there are niche use cases for Bitcoin, right? And when, that's when it comes to cross country. Um, Selling drugs payments to he, the reality is mike look i have friends i have friends in china where i could see and and we can talk about the legality of it fine maybe in 10 years the u.s government says i can't send money to china anymore but i still like my friends i still want to interact with my friends i still want to be able to let's say pay them for a job that they work on work on for me like i could foresee a future where the best way for me to be able to do that would be through something like Bitcoin. And we can, we, we can argue whether that's legal or well, not. I think there's, or, I think there is some value. I think there is some support. value to it, but it's like that's 99% I mean. of the value is sure. fraud. Sure. And the, speculation. The, the, I'd say 99% yeah. is speculation or 90% and five or 7% is fraud. And then there's like one or 2% that is legitimate, interesting, cool, niche use cases and, and cass you and i go a little deeper on this in episode 21 where we talk about kind of our thoughts on bitcoin but i think that largely mirrors my thoughts on cryptocurrencies that there are times when it is useful right when you do need to do the censorship resistant thing or where there's value in that censorship resistant thing and you've talked about like cross-country uh trades there and i think there's also value in terms of like um We've talked before about paying journalists in places where there might be limitations on that or like paying sex workers in places where they might be being removed from payment rails and things like that. But the other flip side of that that we always have to talk about is that censorship resistant is this double edged sword where a lot of the people who need censorship resistant is because the things they're doing are illegal for reasons like there's societally important reasons we've made those things illegal. And that's the trade off of cryptocurrency. And that was also well, just to bring some things yeah. back together. One of my frustrations with Sam Bankman and freed is that he didn't seem to believe in any of like the actual th reasons that crypto should exist and his priority was almost entirely yes. just around the extracting of money yes i guess my problem with the idea of censorship resistance is that if the government makes it impossible for you to turn your bitcoin into currency then it still is useless and it's censorship it, it's censored Right, like if, if they're if they're able to basically prevent you from turning your dollars into Bitcoin or your Bitcoin back into dollars How without going through some sort of regulated they, process. They, but, but like in the, theory, it's a peer there to peer. is someone who wants your Bitcoin. Yeah, but I was saying is like the, the Bitcoin itself is peer to peer. But at sure. some point you have to turn your Bitcoin into dollars. How are you going to do yeah, yeah. that? And, and this is the thing we kind of talked about. If, in our if it's peer to peer, that's how. Yeah, and this is the thing we kind of talked about. Uh, in our episode with Mario Gibney, which is that for Bitcoin to be censorship resistant in terms of like as a meaningful transfer of value, it needs to develop a circular economy where people yeah. are interested in Bitcoin directly in exchange for goods or services. Right. And that that is an important part of developing the censorship resistance of Bitcoin. But people who are likely to be censored 
when you need that censorship resistant are also reasonably more likely to accept Bitcoin for those same reasons, right? That gets to the journalists in a country where there's restrictions on journalism. That gets to the sex worker and things like that. And so there is a place for that. But you are absolutely right that many of the people, including, I think, very clearly Sam Bankman fried see cryptocurrency as a chance to develop these systems outside of regulation where the true power of it for them is that they can extract and keep such a large portion of the money from these people who don't really understand what they get to. And that is, you're right, separate from whatever real value cryptocurrencies has because so much of it is dominated by this leverage and by this speculation and by this brazen desire to take as much as you can no matter the cost. And and I agree that most of the most of the names we've come to know and love are people bent on extracting wealth. So I, I don't think I don't it's not that your point is incorrect. It's just that Bennett and I try to understand that there's some niche value there, some niche, small amount of value in this industry. I like how much we can expound on that and how big that would ever be. I don't know. But I but I will say that, like, the stuff you're talking about is very real. Like a lot of it is straight up Ponzi schemes and people trying to come up with the economics of Ponzi schemes, which is blatant. It's just it's a scam. Like that's just scamming people and trying to steal their money. It's trying to invent a perpetual motion machine. They would say it's experimenting. That's what they would say it is. To me, it's knowing full well that it's a disaster and you're going to get in trouble for doing it. But I don't know. Like this is it's a give and take, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know. I I understand your perspective, Mike, but I, I think we disagree slightly. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, there's a there's another question here from Typical Hog, which is, wait, do FTX or Alameda have a lot of USDT? If so, what if they demand a redemption, but Tether doesn't have enough? Um, as the as Protos helped report out in the Tether papers, Alameda has received over thirty one billion dollars worth of Tether issuance. Based on what we can see in their publicly known wallets, they do not have anywhere near that amount of Tethers left. Alameda and FTX's implosion will almost certainly slacken the demand for new tethers and may affect like the number of redemptions ongoing. But if Tether has been honest, they should be able to handle it. And this gets into some of the other questions I'm seeing in the chat here, which is like, what are the risks of this spreading to Tether? And like, it comes down to how honest Tether has been with us. How much of what do they say they have do they actually have and how much has been moved into accounts or faked on statements for the auditors to sign off on. And assuming they've been honest, things are okay. Assuming they're lying, things could become really, really, really fucking bad really, really fucking quickly. <laughs> so uh, you decide if Tether's being honest or lying to you. Yeah. Do we have and... any idea where any of this Tether ended up? Like the Alameda tether, like how did where did, did they, they go? send it back? Well, they, they couldn't have because it was it, never redeemed. A lot of right? it was used for market making on exchanges or as collateral back when they needed it as collateral for Binance, right? Because back uh, tether was the first collateral that you could use for the Binance futures trading, and so a lot of the Alameda tether issuance was so that they could trade on Binance. And it was but they should have gotten it back at some point. Sure, and they they have redeemed. They've redeemed several billion dollars worth of tethers. Um, but but the, like, tricky note there is that, like, there is this still kind of weird outstanding issue of tether is supposed to only accept dollars in exchange for tethers. And, like, the balance sheet Coindesk saw for tether had only $130 billion or $130 million in cash. And they've supposedly gotten $31 billion in tethers, and it's just hard to imagine $31 billion in relatively liquid cash flowing through Alameda. Yeah, it's unlikely. Let's just put it that way. Um, Sweet. Any other, any other questions? Yeah, let's see. Uh, on the question of Nexo being Nexto, what do y'all think will trigger that collapse? <laughs> well, if Nexo is solvent, then they're okay, right? Yeah. And if they're insolvent but can keep the value of their token high enough, then maybe they're okay. And otherwise, well, anyone who's 
giving them assets or taking a loan from them might be in trouble. Do we know, do they, do they work with a lot of industry, like institutional investors or are they more retail focused? I don't have a good uh, feel on their client base. Do you? I mean, their money comes from retail, I think. But like in terms of where they send it, um, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, I mean, if they're they doing what they say they're doing, they have to be sending it to they have to be sending it to institutions because that's what they tell you they're doing, right? So, who their partners are, we don't know. Um, I mean, one example is it's possible this these withdrawals from FTX were actually from Alameda somehow, right? Like Alameda's paying them back. Yeah, that um, was one so, of my implications right. earlier is that it was Alameda yeah. trying to post collateral to sure. because Nexo had extended them an FTX token collateralized loan and they needed to put up non-FTX token collateral. I mean, it would be crazy if Nexo wasn't doing business with Alameda because Alameda is like the biggest game in town. Like if you're the biggest lender and they're the biggest like market maker and you say you lend to market makers, like it makes sense that you would be dealing with them. Uh, but yeah, we have no clue. And I mean, like, again, like my reporting on that is based totally on the assertion of the Kentucky regulators who say that they are insolvent without their token. Like if that's not a true assertion, then I'm not right. Yeah. So uh, your guess is as good as mine, but if, if you'd rather believe, who would you rather believe? I guess that's your kind of decision you have to make. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone else asks, how does Coinbase primarily make its money through trading fees? And yes, that's primarily how Coinbase makes its trading money. fees. Um, that Better is, question is, how does Coinbase the... lose their money? But <laughs> that's an easy que that's an easy question to answer, though. They just yeah. if... spend all of it. Um, yeah, okay. I think. I, but I do. I, I, I Sorry, do think ahead. that it, it's um, it's clear that Coinbase is kind of up against a wall right now because, as Jim Jim talked about, right these these trading fees are relatively high compared to competitors. Um, and you can't rely on those, especially in a bear market to maintain profit and revenue. Um, so we're going to see some interesting stuff happening with Coinbase in the, the next few months. I am not short Coinbase, so I have no, I have no uh, horse in this race, but it, it does seem like they're, they're running up against a wall right now. Uh, in my opinion, that doesn't, I don't, I don't predict prices though. So yeah. Go listen to our episode with Chainos for more context on Coinbase's business model. Uh, someone else asked if FTX files for bankruptcy, will it be under SIPA? You should ask a lawyer. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're based in the Bahamas, so I have no clue how they're that's based in the Bahamas. Exactly, they're yeah, based in the Bahamas. I, I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> is Gascoin going to open withdrawals soon? Uh, withdrawals are functioning normally as long as you don't try to withdraw. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm busy right now. Just let them know I'm busy. Um, You're busy Cascoin. dealing with other things. Yeah. Cascoin is fine. Cascoin Exchange is fine. That's all I have to say about that. Uh, let's see what else we got. Why is 95% of crypto trading volume in stable coins? Because it's hard for crypto exchanges to get banking. And if you primarily trade against stable coins, you don't need to worry about trying to get banking. You just rely on the stable coins banking and backing to keep your exchange functional is the short Switching answer the risk. Uh, someone else asked, do you think other exchanges will delist FTT? Yeah, the price has plummeted, <laughs> the value's gone, the volume's gone, there's really no reason for them to keep it. And they now know there's US securities investigations ongoing, so I don't think they wanna be exposed to that. Dave didn't Portner's you say you would buy, didn't you say you'd buy everyone's FTT for $22? Bennett? I thought that was you. No, that was someone. Someone said that. I thought I was pretty sure you suggested you were going to buy everyone's FTT for $22. Yeah. Uh, someone asked if we can answer Dave Portnoy's question. And the answer is if you had your Bitcoin on FTX, they're probably with Alameda and Alameda probably gave them to a lender. Yeah. He'll get a percentage of his Bitcoin back. That's the answer to it. You'll, you'll get something back. Probably you'll get something back. Said. Yeah. Uh, why does an exchange like Coinbase need more and higher paid engineers than, say, NASDAQ? Well, I mean, they do some things that NASDAQ doesn't do, like NFTs. Um, yeah. Did Sequoia know what was going on? No, Sequoia didn't even know that Sam was playing League of Legends <laughs> when they invested in his exchange. Sequoia didn't know shit. Y'all are... 
Y'all are looking at the wrong villains here. The VCs I love, I love, invested in Sam are clueless. VCs are stupid. <laughs> I, I, there's so many conspiracy theories that run rampant when it's like, these people can't tie their fucking shoes, man. You don't need to worry about a lot of these conspiracy theories. Like, I don't know. There's, there's so few conspiracies as opposed to just flat out lies and fraud. The conspiracies don't need to be, don't need to be, and laziness. And, and, and it's, it's Occam's razor, right? Like, I think people who try to like build these enormous conspiracy theories are, um, imagining most of them. Yeah, exactly. I uh, mean, they, they know that we're all secretly working for Binance, though. They figured that one out. I thought Soros. Although, although two, weeks ago, people, two weeks ago, people were telling me I was working for FTX. So I, I actually don't know who I'm working for. Soros. But, I, I work for Soros and the, and the Fed is what I've been told. Right? I don't know. I'm a jihadist. That's all right. I know. <laughs> Clashing interests. Um... If eight of 11 billion are missing, does that mean deposit holders get 27 cents on a dollar? Maybe. FTX <laughs> FTX accounts were Maybe. trading over the counter for 15 cents today, I saw. So 27 cents on the dollar is not an unreasonable recovery expectation by the time bankruptcy is done. And might I just hope be it doesn't take optimistic. as long as Matt Gox. Yeah, it might be optimistic after you've paid the lawyer fees, the accountant yeah. fees, the investigator fees, and all the other fees associated with actually going into bankruptcy. Yeah, it's obscene, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do we think will happen to FTX US? That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, did you see the thing I sent you guys that they were they were transferring a bunch of their rat Bitcoin over to an Alameda address? Yeah. 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 If F see and they said FTX US is fully backed even when they wouldn't say that about FTX. But they did used to say that about FTX even when it wasn't true, so who's to say they're not lying? I mean, are they still processing withdrawals? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I believe so. I mean that's a relatively small operation, I think. Yeah, it's compared much to, smaller in volume and liquidity compared to I FTX. have no clue how big it is compared to FTX as a whole. It's possible they were operating that one completely legitimately because they were trying to use it as their, like, uh, what's the as word their, for it? I don't know. Decoy? Like Binance used Binance US in the Tai Chi documents as the right. regulatory shield as their way to avoid the uncomfortable questions about I the think illegal this is right. things they're doing on FTX. And yeah, my guess is they're right. probably okay, but I would still take my money out of there as quickly as possible. But I personally would not be happy if I had money on FTX US right now. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right as well. And and look, this is I want to drive this point home as well. You can't you can't cause a bank run on a on an exchange. Yeah, we're talking about a bank run you should happens. be able to. No, no, no. No, you cannot. A bank run happens to a bank. So, you cannot cause a bank run at an exchange because they shouldn't be lending out customer funds. So, uh no such thing. Um but yeah, I worth testing. Hey, if you have money on there, go ahead and take it out. Why not? Let's see if we got any other questions. Odds of Mashinsky and SBF indictments relatively high. Mashinsky's yeah, gonna go to jail. They're if he doesn't go I, to jail, I'm, like I mean that We're not lawyers. None of us are lawyers, and we're saying this, we're talking totally out of our asses, but yeah. I am so goddamn certain that both of them are gonna try to probably see prison time. Um but who I who knows? Unless they can sell out somebody who's really worth something to the feds, that's all. Yeah. At this point, they've, they've been so blatant and so, yeah. like, loud about what they've done wrong that I think it right. would be really hard to give them no jail time at all. So we'll, we'll yeah. see, but I, that's, what I, that's my guess. Uh, someone else asked, Tether is in Hong Kong, right? What are the risks associated with the CCP shellacking them? Tether is not in Hong Kong. called <laughs> Taiwan and Tether, discussing how Tether was originally set up in Taiwan and now primarily operates out of the Bridge and Virgin Islands. There's still a chance of China shellacking Taiwan, but Tether's primarily out of the British Virgin Islands, and I'm not particularly worried about the risks of China going after Tether. Same. Um, so I'm trying to see if there's other good questions here. Just... 
is Jump Crypto invested in FTX? Uh, yes. Not as far as I know. Are they? Not, not invested, but they had money on FTX, no? Oh, sure, sure, sure. They had some exposure to FTX, like Multicoin and a couple of other people did, who have lost some percent of their assets under management by having them on, on FTX. Uh, Jump Crypto is heavily invested in Solana, though, which Alameda has been aggressively dumping to deal with the fact they have no money. Yep. Do we know? Do we know how um, how Solana performed? Is it how how much is it down? It's like forty percent. It's down bad. Okay. It's like forty percent today. I think it's a lot. It's like, yeah. it's like fifty percent over the last week or something. It's ugly. It's an ugly chart, which it should uh, be. All right. right. Could Bitfinex be doing an FTT style thing with their L with their Leo token? Good question. Could Binance be doing a similar thing with their BNB? B token could bitmax good be question similar thing cz with their says no max token C crypto.com be doing something similar with their cro token could etc 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 you decide the answer to that after looking I, at what happened to fdx exactly i think the question is why do any of them need exchange tokens that's the question you should be asking yourself and i i, can, I have an answer that i can share which i think is they don't need them except for solvency but that's just my wild guess. Uh, Jackson Palmer, a former guest, asked, would banks or other large financial institutions have extended USD loans based on FTT collateral? And Jackson, please, God, I hope not. Please. I really don't think so. I mean, I've, I've looked at I've looked at Silvergate and um, Signature's 10Ks, and, like, they are making loans, I believe, only against Bitcoin. It sounds like they are fairly over-collateralized. Okay. So I'm pretty confident there are no at least U.S. institutions that are like financial institutions directly exposed to FTT. Um, U.S. though, that's a good point. US. I mean, who knows? Who knows internationally? Maybe. Who knows? Who who, who knows, knows what counterparties are willing to extend loans and in what to them for what? So cough, uh, Deltec, it's actually really, cough. really, really good question. Yeah, yeah. Deltech is a good, good, good name to drop right now. Um, I who knows. Who knows what international banks are willing to do and, and loan in what? I think that um, is a really good question from Jackson, um, and we don't have the answer to that. Someone else said, I saw it mentioned that FTX's API was still going into price oracles and bots. Do you guys have any idea on what the risks and implications of that might be? If it's all right, I'll start on that. Uh, We've seen some arbitrage bots and some stuff on other exchanges try to basically effectively arbitrage price differences based on what they're seeing on FTX. And so they've tried to, like, for example, run up prices on other exchanges because they've seen a premium develop on FTX due to the inability to withdraw. Because of that, they've started to drive that up. On chain, you start to see the same thing in other oracles. And this also affects some index products that ingest FTX data. Is that you start to use this thing that's getting a higher and higher premium because the people there are effectively trading with monopoly money. And if you leave it as a data source, you start believing monopoly money is real money and you make trades as if monopoly money is real money. And after a little while, all your real money is gone and you can't get it. Said better than I could. Uh, Wait, so there's, I mean, like, that's the crazy thing is there's still supposedly trading going on in FTX. That makes no sense. There was elite, I thought they shut it off a few hours ago, but for a long time there was. And basically, if you were left there, your choice was either hold on to what I've got now or take a flyer and try to take as much money off the other assholes as I can. Someone asked, are stablecoins actually profitable for issuers? We don't have full financial information for all stablecoins, but Circle has never consistently made a profit. And so unless you're doing things with your reserves that aren't leaving it fully reserved, it is challenging to make a profit as a stablecoin historically. But it as was. Go it up, is it now. It should become yeah. much easier. Yeah. Now they should be doing okay. Yeah, they should be doing great right now. I mean, shit, that's pretty good. pretty good spread on... Uh... I don't, know what, I don't know what, like, short-term treasuries are paying, but it's, like, 3 4%. I mean, yeah, it's not no, bad. It, they should be in substantially better places. Uh... That it? Um, if stable coins are being used for their banking and most of the market is using them to trade, what amount do you think is laundering? 
I don't have a good number for that. Yeah, it's hard to measure a metric like that. It's really hard. I think it's really Impossible. hard to even define define it. I mean, it's 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 a it's a really tough question. I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to answer that. I don't know how to answer yeah. that. I, I, I wish I, I wish I knew that either. Yeah. Uh, someone else, do you think the payments giants, MasterCard, Visa, will start to take a more cautious approach, partnering with crypto exchanges, engaging engaging in institutional capabilities going forward? Yes. Have yes. they been Have they been particularly not cautious up until this I, point? I mean, they've I been doing like they've some been... card issuing and things like that, right? You can still offer. Yeah, Celsius had a credit card briefly, I think. I think they, I think they were yeah. able to issue their credit card before they went under. So. Yeah. I mean, okay, but like, how many people had it? I don't know. This is no. The, I mean, it doesn't I, like, matter. It's is insignificant. Largely. But... Largely, I think they've been relatively cautious compared to other other people. Like, let's say if you're a uh, uh, what, like a security business, uh, a software security business um, who pivots to just being like a Bitcoin ETF. There's other people who have done far, far greater, far more reckless uh, initiatives as opposed to Visa and Mastercard. So, I don't well, know. let's put I it this like way. Been... I mean, Sam had to call his trading fund Alameda research to make it seem like it wasn't a crypto company right uh this is it was bad then it's going to be worse now that sam blew himself up so that's that's a good point good point and and that also is something i just wanted to note is that this dude started Alameda research he, we i don't think anyone fully understands how he made his initial money other than arbitrage it doesn't it doesn't sound like it was legal um and then he like made all these outlandish claims the entire way up, whether it was effective altruism or, you know, just leveling insane claims about other people without ever backing it up. And nobody ever thought maybe this guy is lying to us, but I, sorry, go on, go on, Bennett. Yeah, Sam's bad guy. No, I uh, meant question. <laughs> Next question is, uh, uh, won't these failures lead to significant regulation in the industry? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, that's what Sam wanted. See, he got what he wanted. At the end of the day, he realized that the best thing he could do is sacrifice himself for the greater good of regulation. And so he decided to steal $8 billion and blow himself up. That was his whole plan the whole time. You guys don't know. It's very effective, altruism. It's for the good of us all. Hey, maybe, you, you know what? Maybe he sent the $8 billion to like malaria prevention. Maybe we'll find out he actually did steal it for a good cause. <laughs> he realized that the best thing he could do with his limited time in this earth was build the largest Ponzi he could as fast as he could and give that money to the to others. Malaria nets. Um, okay, so. I mean, if he did that, I would actually be okay with it. Like, fine, you know what? Well, let's find out. Gosh, we're going to find out. If that happens, we're going to bring Mike back on and we're all going to personally apologize to Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, but I suspect that is not going to be uh, the case. Someone asked about contagion to GBTC because of Genesis. GBTC is already GBTC screwed. GBTC has been such a yeah. weird fucking asset for the last 18 months. Like first when BlockFi was arbitraging it because it was so much above NAV. And then the funds that literally got blown up because it was below NAV, I... I don't know. What aren't a stupid they, aren't product. They also, aren't they suing the SEC? They are. Yes. Good job. That'll Good go luck, well. guys. Genius. Yeah, that'll go well. Uh, yeah, it's it's a garbage offering to begin with, I think is what we're all saying. So. Yeah. Who cares? Uh, someone else asks, is there any way you can see the current players disentangling from each other and not killing the entire ecosystem? I think at least Cass and I believe some cryptocurrencies will continue to function no matter what happens to these remaining companies, but there's going to be a bloodbath. I expect there to be a bloodbath. That's not financial advice or things you should like plan your life around, but I expect many cryptocurrency companies are more exposed than they're letting on right now. We're going to see that over the coming weeks. Agreed. All, I got, all I'm going to say about that is that if I'm going to bet on a Ponzi scheme, it's going to be the U.S. dollar. <laughs> I hate that. I'm never gonna live that down. God. No, <laughs> um, don't we think that our government has allowed this to flourish, and that makes them look like complete fools? Well, they at least look a little bit like fools. Yeah. Oh, uh, the and regulators they, look awful. They, they the look regulators look the, the regulators look awful, and they deserve to look awful. I, I, they, they every every ounce of disrespect that goes their way after the hodgepodge of insanity that has transpired over the past three to four years not just in cryptocurrency by the way i'm talking about finance in general 
Um, but I mean, like, yeah. the problem is, like, half of the SEC has been dealing with Elon Musk this whole time. So, like, they haven't really had have a chance they? to get have to any of this other stuff. Have they? They've been trying have they dealt to. with Elon Musk? Well, they've been trying to. Have they? That's how inefficient they are. I don't think they I wonder how many people yet. are just working on Elon Musk every day at the SEC. I really wonder. No, no. Gary. Just Gary. It's just Gary. It's just Gary in an office by himself, like, frantically uh-huh. running around. He, he just once a day yells out, all these things are securities and they won't listen to me. <laughs> and then he goes home. Um, <laughs> someone else asked, what do you think about people looking to decentralized exchanges as an alternative after the implosion of decentralized exchanges? Some will. There will still be a we lot were, of No, 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 but we were talking about this the other day. We were talking about this the other day. It looks like there's no movement to yeah, decentralized exchanges. Up. And, like, a lot of people still, at the end of the day, want dollars, right, more right. than they want any of these other assets. And so because of that, they're going to try to find a way to get dollars, and that means centralized exchanges. Well, and if you look at if you look at the, the function of decentralized exchanges, at least in my experience, at least for the smaller tokens, it's all just wash trading by market makers for whatever purposes. Like, 99% of the volume is dominated by a, a few, a very small group of players. Like, it's worse than any centralized exchange. So, good luck. Because uh, those guys are going to get blown up, too. So, what happens after that? And, I mean, good luck. He was invested, in, the SBF was invested in Serum um, and yeah. numerous, was market making it at decentralized exchanges and all this other nonsense. So, I think um, it's it's early days. And maybe who knows what happens, but um, for now, that is not a realistic possibility. Um, so, Mike, do you have any closing thoughts on what this means for cryptocurrency before we wrap this up tonight? I think that uh, if anybody if there was anybody you didn't want to blow up, maybe after Coinbase it was FTX. Just because of how prominent they were publicly, just because of Sam's political con- contributions and role, uh, because of his, because everybody thought that he was the smartest guy in the room. Uh, and seeing that he was the one who blew up, and blew up so badly, and was so egregiously fraudulent in everything he was doing, uh, that's going to have a very big effect on people's belief in this whole thing. It might not be today or tomorrow, but a lot of people are going to realize maybe it's time to get out. And as we all know, there's not enough money in the system for everybody to get out in time. So it's going to be very interesting. Uh, Cass, do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap this up and say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight? Yeah, no, I just, you know, try to uh, hang on to your butts, everybody. It's going to be a wild week and month and year. uh, And... I hope nobody is severely impacted by this. I hope our, our listeners and our viewers are, are honest. Oh, and yeah, if, if seriously, and this is a serious statement, like I've been very negative about cryptocurrency and all that stuff. At the end of the day, if you lost some money, even if it's all of your money, it's just money. It's going to be okay. Don't hurt yourself. You know, like call the suicide hotline if you need help. I'm, I'm being totally serious because there are people who are going to be very seriously hurt by this. Um, right, that, it, it, it's a, a really good point. I know that that we laugh about some stuff and we we try to, as critics and skeptics, have a good time as this entire uh, industry uh, goes to levels we haven't seen in a really long time. Um, but yeah, it is it is a real thing and people have truly lost money and people have probably burn some friendships and some family relationships in regard to recommending FTX to their family and friends. And, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that happened to you. I'm, I, I truly am. I don't Unless you're Dave Portnoy, who... cause then you deserve it. But he's a multimillionaire. He, I yeah. don't care what happened. Well, he was, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. So uh, look, Again, as we broach this serious topic, I just want to thank our listeners, our viewers. I really appreciate you guys tuning in uh, and wanting our perspective at all. I hope all of you are okay and not seriously impacted by this. And if you are, as Mike just said, you're going to be okay. Uh, I know that's not probably something you want to hear, but you're going to be okay. And um, yeah, I don't know. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for for joining us again. Thank you all very much. And uh, stay safe out there.
Okay. 